had a good time last night. If, if, I'm not sure how many folks were at the uh, welcome reception last night, but it was a great time. I think there's a, probably a few people that are still sleeping off uh, the welcome reception, but uh, they'll probably be joining us in, uh, in not too distant future. Anyway, welcome to uh, the first annual US BevX. Um, we've got a terrific conference um, planned for everyone, really where we're gonna uh, take a deep dive into exploring what we're calling the new normal. Um, and the, the really the blurring of lines between categories and uh, between beer and wine and spirits and cider. Um, and I said this last night, <clears throat> driven by the kind of the changing behavior of our consumer out there, that uh, on any given day, uh, this is likely to have a, a glass of wine, as a, a try a new craft beer, uh, explore some of the um, some of the terrific craft spirits that are uh, that are being created, and um, of course, cider is exploding. So it's a really fun time for our industry. Um, but it's also a really challenging time, and uh, and I you know I say this with all due respect to the to the makers out there. I mean it's, it obviously starts with a with a a quality product, but then going from there and how do you get the attention of the consumer or the retailer or the restaurant tour? And so those are some of the things we're going to be looking at at um, at our conference over the next couple of days. Uh, we've also got a terrific trade show. We've got 130 of some of the industry's best suppliers downstairs um, showcasing the latest products and services. Definitely make sure you, you find a way to get down there and, and uh, meet some of those folks and see what they're doing because it's, uh, it's really incredible. And those are some of the, it's really where a lot of the innovation is happening um, in our industry, especially with regard to quality on the production side. Um, <clears throat> we've also got a happy hour planned uh, at four o'clock on the uh, downstairs on the, exhibit, uh, on the exhibit floor, which is gonna be an awful lot of fun. So let's just get things started. Um, please help me in, in welcoming Mark Barden author and speaker with Eat Big Fish to help uh, kick off the day. Good morning. Great, you are awake, fantastic. Thank you for showing up. That's a good, uh, good start here. Um, what George neglected to mention, it's up on the screen today, and I'd encourage you all to uh, take advantage of this. This is the first and we should be making sure that we tweet out as much as we can uh, all the great stuff that you're hearing about here to share this with the industry share this with uh, people who maybe haven't made it today so I first um, met George about a year ago I think it was now when he was first uh, conceiving of this notion we sat down had a, a great lunch in Larkspur which is where I live don't be fooled by the accent I'm a Californian at heart and George and I were talking about this idea of the new normal. What, what exactly does that mean? And we're going to spend the whole morning session today with three different takes on what the normal is, new normal is, and how it's impacting you and your business. So George, um, I think, you know, had, had this notion, which I'd, I hadn't thought of before sitting down and talking to him about, just how much of a blending between the categories that, they are, that exist today how often beers are acting more like wines today in the way they talk about the content of their package, and how some of the craft spirits look more like beers in some sense with their very kind of macho appeal. And we're going to look at a number of these different instances this morning and talk about what it means. And the opportunity for all of you here, if you're from the beer side, from the spirit side, from the cider side, is to learn from each other. So in addition to content you're going to be exposed to this morning from the stage here, in the dialogues that you have on the trade show floor at lunch over happy hour this evening, be having this magpie mentality towards the people you're speaking. You're looking for bright, shiny objects, insights, ideas you can steal and take back to whatever part of the industry you work in and apply to your own business. Because that is the definition of the new normal, this blending of categories driven by the demands of this millennial generation who think, act, feel, behave differently, very differently than previous generations. And the customers, uh, the customer, legal seafoods are going to hear from this morning, whole foods are going to hear from this morning, talking about how they see the new normal showing up in their stores and what it is that they want from brands and what it is they're seeing working. So three uh, segments of, to this morning's session. First, we're going to hear from Nielsen. Nielsen is going to show in numbers what the new normal looks like a rapid fire 15 minute burst of wow statistics that is just going to put us in the right frame of mind to go my goodness the change here is significant then you're going to hear from this guy called Mark Barden who looks and sounds a lot like me he's going to be talking to you about challenger brands how do we need to behave as brands and marketers in the new normal 
in order to make sure that we get our fair share of all the growth that is out there for us, what are the threats and the opportunities. And then lastly, closing out the session with a conversation here, informal conversation in which we'll ask you to participate with questions and answers uh, with um, Doug Bell from Whole Foods and Sandy from Legal Seafoods, giving us the customer perspective on the new normal. Okay? So first uh, up is uh, John Collins, who's also a Brit, is the president of Nielsen, and Danelle Cosmel, of, who's the VP of Nielsen, who are going to be giving us their sense of what does the new normal look like in terms of metrics. So please give a, a nice warm welcome to John and Danelle. <laughs> He's driving. Okay, morning everybody. And yes, don't be fooled by the accent. I'm actually a Chicagoan at heart. <laughs> Haven't lived there for a whole six and a half months now. I can tell you Chicago's so much better than New York. Uh, hey, <laughs> come on, Chicago people in the house. It's a dangerous thing to say. <laughs> well, the hey. Um, first, Mark, thanks for the promotion. I'm actually the president of Nielsen CGA, <laughs> which is the specialist on-premise division of Nielsen. It'd be nice to be president of the whole thing, maybe one day, but, but not quite yet. So, you know, we, we've been talking in preparation for today about what is the new normal. And I think, for me, it's complex. It's complexity. We talk today about drinkers having a repertoire we never used to talk about that. We used to know that that was a beer guy, um, that was a wine guy. You know, it was much simpler in the past to understand how people interacted with their, their drinks of choice. Now we talk about repertoire. We used to talk about time of day. It used to be very simple. People would drink beer during the day and after work. They'd have uh, spirits later on at night and they'd have wine with a meal. Very simple. We could all understand that. That's gone out the window now as well. And so we'd now, then we talk about occasionality. Is it um, a, a high-tempo night out with friends? Is it an intimate um, you know, meal with, with a partner? You could understand what drinks would be used on those occasions. But again, everything has, has been mixed and remixed now. So it, it's much more complex than it ever was. And if you think about the, the type of premises that probably most epitomize the old way, the, the normal, the standard, the place that regular customers would go to to have their usual drink from the bartender who knew what they wanted as soon as they walked in, that was the neighborhood bar. And guess what? We're in this new era of complexity and the neighborhood bars are dying away. We've lost one in six in the last 10 years, so 12,000 fewer than we had 10 years ago. And it's not just a US phenomenon. The Great British pub, the community pub, is closing at a similar rate. The brasserie in France is closing at a similar rate. Pretty much any market we go into and measure what's going on with on-premise, we see this same thing happening. And then in its place, what is it about this market and restaurants? It's not like you know, we're underserved with restaurants for restaurants in America, but still, We've seen a 40% increase in restaurant numbers over the last decade, an additional 60,000. That's not the total number. And we're talking licensed restaurants here, so I'm not including the, the, the fast casual, the, the quick service restaurants. We're talking licensed restaurants, up to 211,000 now across the states, 40% increase in the last decade. What does that mean for brand owners? You know, the, the brands that would play well in the blue collar neighborhood bar, they're under pressure, they're seeing their customer base shrink. The brands that can play well in this new, you know, less defined space, which typically has food at its hub, you, know, you need to make an argument to the restaurateur, and by the way, 85% of them are independently owned, so it's not like you can just build your brands off the back of chains in this marketplace. It's almost you know, venue by venue. Uh, we call it brand-to-brand -brand combat as you try and explain to the restaurateur why he should be choosing your brand on the back bar, on the tap, uh, on the wine list, as opposed to the dozens of alternatives that are available to him. And another thing about the new normal, we would say, is that somebody said last night, choice is a great thing. Choice liberalizes people. Choice gives you more options. That's wonderful. But um, there's a, a famous um, a sociologist called Schwartz who said, just because choice is good doesn't mean more choice is better. And actually, there could be such a thing as the tyranny of choice, too much choice, paralysis through options. There's a famous case study of a guy who was found practically weeping in the aisle of a supermarket in front of 57 different types of uh, soap powder. So what am I supposed to do? Brain shuts down. 
we have the same issue here. You know, Britain um, is a similarly developed, mature on-premise marketplace, and yet it has only about half the brands available on the back bar that you'll see in a bar in America. So 57 different products. That's not 57 different bottles, facings of bottles, 57 distinct brands available on that bar. When you've got that forest of choice in front of people, how are they supposed to make an informed decision? Often they can't. What will they do? They'll either default to a mega brand because they know it and they're familiar with it, or, and I'll come on to this in a moment, they'll look for guidance, but can that person who's there actually provide the guidance? So 57 products on the back bar, 11 of them typically flavored vodkas. So you know, the new norm is to just have, in my opinion, a crazy overstocking on the average bar, which means for brand owners, what's the value of a point of distribution? Building a brand in on-premise used to mean go out there, secure distribution, customers will engage with the product, and you can build your brand from there. But if actually you have got um, so much competition on that back bar, you might have a point of distribution, but it's almost worthless to you because the customer can't even see your product in the forest of, of bottles that's on the back bar there. And that was my favorite of the, the flavored vodkas. This was the Alaska Distillery smoked salmon flavored vodka. You know, obviously, we all like to kickstart our nights out with a, a shot of that. Um, <laughs> But you know, there, are, there are the same number of citrus vodkas on the back bar as there are gins in total. There's a, there is a something we are, we're seeing now called flavor fatigue, which you might have, have heard coming through the ether. And we're seeing people just start to, you know, just uh, both customers and, and bar staff and wait staff just sort of roll their eyes when they see yet another marshmallow vodka, pineapple vodka, citrus in particular, just spreading out, spreading out onto the bar. And actually, we see they don't justify their space on the bar based on their sales. So volume, year on year, of flavored vodkas is down in the on-premise. But the number of flavored vodkas on the market is up 6%. So you've got more and more brands competing for a, a sub-segment that is actually um, over-served. And you know, don't just take my word for it. The uh, brand director at Diageo made the point recently that they got lazy and having a 40-second flavor of vodka just to extend the range, try and colonize more space on the bar or the shelf in the supermarket wasn't really the way to, to build an engaging strategy, a sustainable strategy going forward. And similarly, recently, the CEO of Brown Foreman has made that point as well about they don't want to play in that space. So you've got all of this confusion. You've got all of these brands. You've got a consumer that then is saying, well, help me out. 85% of customers, every time we do this research in any market, always comes back to pretty much this number, will take the advice of the person behind the bar or who's waiting the table when it comes to what they should choose to drink. That's a massive opportunity for you to have an army of advocates who are promoting your brand. But have they heard of it? Do they understand it? Uh, are they able to advocate? Or actually, are they as confused as the customer themselves? Because there's just so many brands to try and, and keep track of. That can be great for the customer. Myself and my colleague Scott there were in a, a bar in Chicago a, a couple of months back, and we spotted Macallan 18-year-old on the back bar. Absolutely wonderful drink. We asked the, 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 the uh, lady who was waiting our table, how much for a couple of uh, shots of Macallan? And she quoted us the price for just the, the regular whiskey in the venue. Was it about $8? That's a ridiculous price. <laughs> so obviously, we stayed there for three or four hours and <laughs> really got our money's worth. But yeah, that, that, that's great for us. Doesn't do the operator any favors. Doesn't do the, uh, doesn't do the brand many favors either. Um, and you, you see similar stories with people not understanding what beers are on tap, um, what's on rotation, misdescribing beers. So <coughs> I believe there's an intensive effort required to, to get into the venue and educate people. 0.6% growth in craft beer. Now, listening to everybody talk last night, you might have thought that uh, it was going to be much higher than that. It isn't. Yes, there's been a meteoric rise. It's tapered off. Right now, craft represents two-thirds of the taps on the average bar, 11 taps on the bar. 
only one third of the volume. I say only, that's come from nowhere to be one third of the volume, but does it merit that many taps? And does the retailer understand that they could improve their throughput if they were to rejig the formation? Spirits, every category pretty much that we track is in growth year on year, uh, as spirits take share away from beer. 75% um, of that growth is coming from rum and tequila, so that's $750 million of additional value last year coming from those two categories alone, as we all took into Dark and Stormies and Bloody Marias. And then my last point before I hand over to Danelle, when it comes to wine, we all know the adage that you build a brand in on-premise and then move that trend over into off-premise, and that is never any clearer than when you see when we survey customers about their usage of wine in the on-premise, 82% saying that if they try something in on and they like it, they'll look for it next time they're in off. So hopefully you've heard something in on and you liked it, and I'll hand over to off. Okay, thanks. Okay, so we've been talking about the new normal. How did we get here? And what's been happening over the past 10 to 15 years in arriving at the new normal? And the first number that I'll start with is 12%. So 12% share of alcohol drinks, that represents what wine and spirits have gained from beer since 2002. So am I saying beer is no longer relevant? Of course, that's not it at all. Um, wine and spirits, however, are more, becoming more relevant. They have become more relevant. And a lot of these dynamics are happening because there's so much more interaction with all three categories. So what's an example of one of those interactions? The first is 35% of wine drinkers also purchase craft beer, and that's up from 26% in, from 2012. And I think what's also interesting is that um, when we think about drinking occasions in particular and their role in that interaction. So if you think about traditional wine drinking occasions and something like food pairing, now Food pairing is also a craft beer drinking occasion. And when you think about something like a really traditional beer drinking occasion, and Super Bowl is probably the most traditional and iconic beer drinking occasion that we can think of, it's also becoming more of a wine drinking occasion too. Um, so what's the new normal with millennials? Well, 40% of millennials say that they're drinking all three categories, beer, wine, and spirits. And um, I think something that was really interesting in all of this too is if you look at millennials that are drinking just one category, only 4% of millennials say that they're drinking wine only. So we all know that wine drinkers are no longer just wine drinkers, but even more so among millennials. 10,292. These are the number, this is the number of new beer, wine, and spirits items that Nielsen tracked over the past two years. So um, a lot, and John spoke to everything that the consumer and the shopper is trying to navigate within the store and when they're in bars and restaurants. But within the store, it's happening too. A lot to navigate, and what's driving a lot of this innovation? Well, first, if we look at, there are some things that are happening in terms of innovation that no one can really categorize yet. And hard sodas and hard root beer is probably one of the best examples from 2015. So is it a craft beer? Is it a flavored malt beverage? It might be a little bit of both, depending on the brand, depending on the price point, depending on the flavor. Mm -hmm. And so I think one of the big questions coming up is, is this going to continue to be the new normal, something like hard root beer or hard soda, or is it the new normal for this year, for 2016, for 2015, and then we'll move on to a different new normal in 2017. Another kind of common theme across beer, wine, and spirits in terms of innovation is above premium and high end. So high end is definitely getting more than its fair share of that 2,000 plus, of those 2,000 plus items. So um, we see that within spirits, a lot is coming from high-end whiskey. Within craft or within beer, it's a lot of the craft and the local brands. Um, and within wine, it's a lot of the higher-end red blends and even a lot more of the dark red blends too. So speaking of high-end, $10.7 billion. That's the amount that high-end beer, wine, and spirits have gained in the past four years. So pretty substantial. We know, <laughs> we know that consumers are trading up. We know that premiumization is happening. 
before we talk too much about premiumization, I kind of want to step back to a little bit what John was talking about in terms of mainstream brands are still important. If we think about the mid and budget tier across all of these categories, they still represent about half of the volume of alcoholic beverages. So there's still a big role that all of those brands within that space play. That said, the high end is still driving a lot of the growth. So what's happening? We know there's interaction. We know there's interaction between beer, wine, and spirits. What's happening at that high end of beer, wine, and spirits? There's even more interaction at that high end. So 50% of high end spirit drinkers are also purchasing craft. And that's up from 40% from just two years ago. So um, this is something that I think we'll also continue to see. We'll continue to see increased interaction among those high-end drinkers, especially with the high-end spirits and craft beers. 550%. This is the growth rate of grapefruit beer from 2015. Um, <laughs> so keep in mind, we're talking about probably just a handful of brands with this and a really small base. Um, I think that, and also to kind of um, follow up from John's comments about flavor, I mean, there is flavor fatigue, but at the same time, and those flavors can come and go from one, maybe the last two years, and then everybody's on to the next flavor after that. What's interesting that we're starting to see that I think we haven't really saw in like from five years ago and beyond is that there are, we're starting to see similar flavor trends cross boundaries between spirits and beer. So flavors aren't just about spirits anymore. Last year was a big year for grapefruit beer. Last year was also a pretty big beer year for grapefruit spirits. They were up 62%. We saw similar trends in the past couple of years with apple. We saw similar trends in the past couple of years with things even like chili pepper that are up triple digits in both spirits and beer. And finally, three. Three of the top 10 craft brands within the DC region are local to this area. So this is when we're talking about retail space. So if we were talking about bars and restaurants, that number would probably be even greater. But I think the biggest thing here is that it's local, local, local. We know that local is important to drinkers. We know that it will probably continue to become more important. Um, in some work that we did last year, uh, we found that over 50% of millennials said that when they're thinking about a beer purchase, the concept of local can impact their purchase decision. So I think it just goes back to that ability to tie in the um, drinker, create an experience for them, create a story for them, and um, I think we'll continue to see this trend grow too. So with that, we are a little over time, <laughs> and I wanted, to, I wanted to thank everyone. Give them a round of applause, please. <laughs> thank you. I do have a couple of quick follow-ups for you before you, before you leave. The, I think there's a lot of great stats. The one that surprised me was the craft beer. Mm. That, it just seems like things have flattened out. Now, can you give a little bit more texture behind either of you about, yeah. are there pockets where it's still in growth? What's happening there? Sure. Should I go first? Okay. Yeah, and then I can follow up. <laughs> and, and we deliberately thought, you know, it's not often I'll look at a slide and I'll go, what I need is 0.6%. <laughs> That's what I need to tell people. That's the big number. Um, because it is, you know, it goes against sort of perceived wisdom. Craft's huge. Craft's growing. Craft's everywhere. Actually, you look volume year on year, it is plateauing. And it's the first wave of craft brewers who are feeling the pain. So, you know, the, the flagship brands of, of those breweries are, are in double-digit volume decline year on year. And it's... Yeah, again, it used to be that for those brands, it's quite a simple strategy because, you know, if it's not these brands, but if Bud was losing volume to, to Miller mm. or Heineken are losing volume to, um, you know, Peroni, they could, they could see, and it, it really was quite a, a zero-sum game, if I can fight back, then I can reclaim and, and build from there. Or if I want to build my brand, I'm going to go after that guy. Now, it's time back to Danelle's point about local, 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 they're losing volume to the thousand new breweries that have come through. And so it, that, that volume is dissipating down and the category volume is not keeping pace with the entrant. So demand is not keeping up with supply in on, yeah. or just coming to parity almost. Do you have anything to add to that? No? 
Yeah, I would say, I mean, a lot of what we see that happens in on-premise then translates and transfers into off-premise several years later, and we're starting to see that now. Mm -hmm. And so the same thing is happening in off-premise. And this year, this past year was the first year where we started to hear some, you know, people were a little concerned in the industry talking about slowness of growth of crafts, and we're definitely seeing some slowness of growth. And most of that is coming from the large national brands. And um, in some cases, even in off-premise, we're starting to see some declines of those large national brands. Um, for the long tail of craft, and in that case, we're talking about thousands of brands, um, that's where we're still seeing strong double-digit growth of almost 20%. But at the same time, we're talking about those small brands combined still represent less than 15% of craft volume. Mm. So still not large enough to make a big impact in terms of overall craft trends. And it's, you know, for the most part, a lot, of, a lot of the large national brands that have already expanded their footprint to a national level, and they're, they might be at a point where there, there just isn't any more room for expansion. So, John, give me one last soundbite, and I'm really interested in this idea of how trends come into the market, and they kind of take a while, and they peak, and then they go into decline. You mm -hmm. talked about flavors specifically. Are you seeing a compression in that cycle of how quickly things come up, hit the peak, and then decline? What's happening? I think we're, we're definitely seeing more noise. You know, it, it, because of the, the cross-category drinker and, and the, the fickle consumer with this broader repertoire. So is, is it happening any faster than it used to? Yes, but maybe not dramatically <laughs> faster. But, but what is happening is you're seeing this turbulence as the, the, the guy is not easily labeled as a beer guy anymore. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's that complexity that's the, the beauty of it all for me. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. The nail, the clicker. Yeah, can't go without that. Thank you. Um, you know, I think one of the things that we're going to wrestle with over the next day or so is that idea about how quickly things are peaking and troughing. There's a, there's a classic aphorism about market research that I'm quite fond of which is uh, using the data of the past to determine where to go in the future is like driving using the rear view mirror. You've probably heard something like that before, which is not to say that looking at the data is not really incredibly informative. It is. But where it's going to go is the job of the entrepreneur, taking an educated guess about what's on the margin, being the first to spot it and go there first is, I think, just something for us to think about as we go through uh, the rest of the session here. So I'm going to talk to you about challenger brands um, and what it feels like <laughs> to be that little sumo wrestler on the left of the screen there. I suspect that many of you identify more with that little guy than with that big guy. And that big guy isn't just the major national brands that uh, John and Donnell referenced. It could be a mega trend that's working against you. You might be in the flavored vodkas business and you're seeing that thing get a little bit of pressure. There could be any number of versions of that. But I'm going to talk to you about being a challenger brand and some of the strategies that you can use to win in the new normal, to win in these times of turbulence, of constant change. If we learned one thing from the last presentation about what the new normal definition really is, it's this notion of constant change. Things are going to be in flux for years to come. So I uh, am a partner at a consulting firm called Eat Big Fish, and we are specialists in helping challengers eat their big fish, attack the central challenge that faces them in their business, and figure out how to win despite probably being under-resourced versus the big fish. We're going to talk about that today, some, some um, of the strategies you can use. We publish books, so there's a 17-year project, the Challenger Project, that looks at brands across all kinds of different businesses, not just uh, alcohol brands, but we look at financial services, we look at automobiles, we look at soft drinks, and we figure out those brands that are punching above their weight, that are achieving outsized results based on, uh, compared to their resources. What is it that they're doing? And what can we all learn from those brands and lay down some principles? I'm going to be sharing some principles with you today about how to be a challenger brand and punch above your weight. I think the concept really for all of us to engage in, whether you're sitting there with a healthy business and a decent budget or you're just getting started as a new producer, that the new normal, this flux, has turned us all into challengers. And as much as it's useful to see the data, 
I'm just going to show you a few slides and a few stories about how the new normal is showing up and how it got started. And let's think about where it's been and where it's going to go. So this big bang of trends, it's millennials coming in with very different understanding and appreciation of where they want to drink and what they want to drink and when and how. It's customers making demands of stop people when they're in my aisle. Give them something new to look at. That's going to create the till ring that we need. And it's people like this fella. Oh, sorry, he's coming next. If you're thinking about wine, and that's the image that comes to mind today, that's the old-fashioned code of the wine business. This is the codes of Napa Valley. It's beautiful wine. It's Cabernet grapes hanging off the vine. And that's what we maybe all have thought about, what wine represents a few years ago. But then we get people coming along like Vaynerchuk, who started this 20 years ago. He's talking not just about wine to dudes, because he's talking about the Jets and the Bengals game at the weekend up on his chalkboard, right? He's bringing a new generation in and saying, we're going to demystify this. We're all going to have an honest conversation about how to enjoy wine. He started a lot of this kind of thing, and there are many other people just like him in different categories. But today, it looks like this. The same trends that Vaynerchuk got going now looks like this called Wine Riot. See the tattoo on her knuckles? She's interested in wine riot. Has anybody here been to a wine riot? This is an event. Yes, you have. Great. So put your hand up again. So look around. Go talk to her. What's your name? Erica. Erica. Go talk to Erica at the break and ask her what it was like to be there. I haven't been to one. I've just read about them, but I'd love to go see them. This is a 1,000 young millennials in a large room. There's a DJ in the corner. He's playing drum and bass louder than you, and I could probably stand it. There's a photo booth for you and all your brand new best friends that you just met at the conference to go and have your pictures taken. And they're tasting 250 wines from around the world. And the invitation is clearly, are you ready to riot? So this notion that we have about sitting in our Adirondack chairs, sipping fine cabs, it's gone for this generation. This is how they want to experience wine. This is what they want to do with their lives. And it's rebellious. And here's the original re rebellion. Who's, who's this? Iggy Pop. There's only one Iggy Pop. The point of this slide is not to point to Iggy so much as the banner to his left, the Sailor Jerry Rum brand, started by Steve Grass, a decade or so ago now, Steve Grass explicitly set out to design a rum to act like a bourbon. Right? So his point was, rum's all kind of behave the same way. It's driven by the codes of that category, which is jolly pirate, cartoons of pirates. I'm going to act more like Jack than Jack. And I'm going to put this brand on the road with every hard metal, heavy, heavy metal band, every punk rock band I could get my hands on, and to seed the brand with that community. And that's the way this is going to grow. And he didn't spend a nickel on TV advertising and grew that brand to be bigger than Captain Morgan by acting like a bourbon. Is it rums and bourbons coming together, acting very differently. This is Steve Grass's other brand, uh, Hendrix. I'm not even sure which code Hendrix is borrowing from. It's kind of a little bit steampunk, a little bit classic English, but he's created something wholly new that acts in a different way than any other brand in that category before. And he puts it in a, a black bottle that he found in an apothecary store. And he said, he told us when we interviewed him for this, every time I did focus groups with that bottle, people hated it. Why do I bring out a brand that people are going to hate? Because I'm trying to signal difference. I'm trying to stop them at the shelf and pay attention. Absolute's doing it too. So Absolute Tune is a New Zealand uh, Sauvignon Blanc blended with vodka in a champagne bottle in this kind of sleeve. And it's a special order. It's only available in certain nightclubs. But it signals the new normal in one brand, this collision of different cues and references brought together to blend into new, entirely new things. <laughs> this is a brand called The End of History. Uh, it comes from BrewDog. I'm going to be talking more about them in a moment, so I won't dwell on it too much today. But to suffice it to say, at the time the end of history was brewed, it was the strongest beer in the world. It's 55% ABV. It's sold and enjoyed like a scotch. It's $800 a bottle. They sell lots and lots of beers. But they bring out these, periodically, these beers to really challenge people's understanding of what they think a beer is. I'll explain the taxidermy later. 
Um, here's one I found from CircleUp. So CircleUp are here today uh, at the conference. They're running a workshop today. Uh, this is a, a, um, a crowdfunding platform. And this is the world's first vodka soda, according to them. Jane hasn't come out yet, but it's a really interesting idea of blending the codes of soda and vodka. Here's another one that I really loved. It's pronounced mocha. Mocha is cola and red wine, which sounds gross to me. And yet, the kids, the young adults of Spain, enjoy their red wine this way. So somebody's had the great idea to bring this. You, yeah, you know, you, you know this? Have you had some? Uh, yeah, not only in Spain. Not only in Spain. Um, where, where do they, do they enjoy that here? No, um, I'm, I'm from Europe, and um, in Europe it's very common for young kids to start drinking wine with Great. So young kids in Europe, very common to have them drink Coke and uh, red wine together. So if we want to think about where this market's going, where will it be in five years? When Johns and Donella are back on stage here five years from now presenting the latest round of stats, maybe we'll all be talking about uh, Coke and red wine. And maybe an entrepreneur in the room is thinking, that's a big idea. I'm going to do a version of that. But that's what the new normal looks like. And uh, the point I want to make, and I think John and Donnell made this point really well too, about this doesn't mean the end of big brands. This doesn't mean the end of these massive, the Bud Lights, the Miller Lights of the world. Miller Lite created a 6% lift for itself by saying, great, you know what, this new normal, this explosion of choice, all this wacky, crazy stuff that's happening, while they're all zagging over there, we're going to zig over here, and we're going to get back to our heritage can, the white can that Miller Lite have been struggling to defend their volume from all these different uh, explosion of choice, one way they did that was to say, we're not playing this game, we're going back to heritage and roots. So for all the trends going in that direction, there's almost always a counter trend going in this direction too. And one of the opportunities for all of you is to think about which one of these games am I going to play? And if you've got more than one uh, brand in your portfolio playing different games with different brands, so you're hedging against the possibilities of change and what it might do to your business. So that's what the boom, big bang, of the new normal looks like, just a little bit of flavor of that. I'm sure you've got your own versions, and I'd love to hear some at the breaks. If you want to come and tell me a story like uh, Mocha, I'd be all for it. Um, the point I want to land with you, if you're a brand owner or you're a retailer dealing with this, is that the noise coming at young millennials looks like this vibrant wall of orange. 10,000 plus new items introduced in the last two years alone, Nielsen said. It's a wall of sound, a wall of noise, and your brand is on there. Can you see it? There's a little one pixel black dot. That's you, if you're launching a new brand. I don't care if you're Bud Light, frankly, these days. That's you. You have to compete for the attention of the millennial. So we live in a world of almost unlimited abundance and choice. The one thing that is and will always remain unlimited is the attention of the consumer. What I want to switch gears and talk to you about now is how challenger brands behave in order to grab the attention, get people by the scruff of the neck and say, pay attention to me. I've got something interesting in amongst this sea of 10,000 new launches. Some of you may be sitting there going, ooh, this all sounds really hard, and I'm not sure I'm up for it. And that's fine. What defines a challenger brand is not being small. What defines a challenger brand is not even being number two and huge versus number one. What defines a challenger is having, A, big ambitions that significantly exceed R, your resources. It's a little piece of math, the only math I have in this presentation. When A, your ambition, significantly exceeds resources, and you are prepared to accept the implications of that gap, that's what makes you a challenger. Ambitions bigger than your resources, a willingness to break the rules. What are the things that you need to do if your ambitions are bigger than your resources? This is what we apply ourselves to in our work at Eat Big Fish, understanding how challenger brands win. There are five things you're going to need to do. There's probably more than that. I only have time for five. First one is you're going to need a fresh insight. You're going to need an insight nobody else has yet had about the category and how it works. You're going to then need to become famous for that insight. You're going to bake it into your product, your brand, your experience, your bar, and you're going to need to become famous for it. I'm going to tell you how challenges do that. You're going to need to have absolute conviction. 
So in this sea of change and this swirl of the new normal, you need to be very clear about where you stand and what you stand for so that you have a center, you have a true north in the middle of this maelstrom. You're going to need to have creativity and invention at every single touch point, every single aspect of your business, and you're going to have to find more resources, more resources than you have, but somebody out there has got those resources. You just have to figure out how to get it. Uh, I'm going to, sorry, sorry, pause. Can we just go back to that? Just let me set up this film. Sorry, my fault. I want to show you, it's a two to three minute film here of challenger brands from all across the world. There are some different um, alcohol challenges in here. Brewdog is in here. Look out for that. Steve Grass is in here. Uh, if you're really paying attention, at the end, I'll ask you to shout out how many of these brands you spotted. So this is just, there's about 10 challenger brands in here, each one giving an insight about what it means to succeed in the new normal, because every category has its own version of it. Roll the film, please. Thank you. We definitely thought of ourselves as a challenger brand, as a sort of outsiders that were taking a fresh look at an industry that we felt needed massive change. There's a very rigid segmentation. This is a rum, this is a whiskey, this is a gin. And uh, I found it very easy to go in and just mess with that because no one had. No one thought, you know, anyone in the world would go and stay with you know, someone in their home. That was such a, you know, a scary idea. Uh, and we proved that actually it's not a scary idea. It's something that people want to be doing. You know, there's a lot of old truths and myths out there that luxury brands need to represent old times and old days. And we think the exact opposite. We think it's very important to be of the times. There's been a lot of different kind of hotel uh, experiences, a lot of different designs, but always based on the five star. And we never understood why certain things had to be that way. Our biggest mission when we set up our company, and it's still our biggest mission today, is just to make other people as passionate about great craft beer as we are. It's a company that is really about the relentless pursuit of the truth. Our entire sort of mission around this is to tell a truthful and unbiased account of the things that matter in the world today. We're going to go and try and get 400 people their jobs back. That's why we want to go and start yeah, a great global denim company. When I looked at oral care, I saw oral scare. Everything was driven by fear and shame. In a more enlightened age and day, you don't have to talk that way to get people to get excited about your product. You have to actively focus on culture and uh, specifically roll out your core values as soon as possible, ideally day one. Start small and make it good. It made so much sense to me and it completely changed how I was thinking about uh, what I wanted to do. Really, we never lost the sort of, you know, we're, we're the small guy challenger mentality and, and you know, part of my job is to make sure we never do. How many did you spot? Yell them out. How many? Who was, who was up there in that reel? Hendrix, yep. Sailor Jerry, good. You spotted the booze one. That's good, yeah. You're a tunnel vision group, aren't you? Who else was there? Who? Brewdog, Audi. Airbnb, great. Hello. Warby Parker, did you spot Warby Parker? Yeah, tons of different challenger brands, tons of different industries. And they're all completely different in many ways, but they're following some very similar practices and principles. And it's that I want to give you uh, some insight into. What is it you can do to act like a challenger brand? Challenger strategy. So the first thing you're seeing here is embracing intelligent naivety. Many challenger brands are created, industries are disrupted by people with no experience in that category. So one of the things you need to be very careful about in, this, in these sessions, in this conference, is learning from those with tons of experience. Brilliant, you can get all kinds of new insights. But at the same time, trying to adopt some naivety and say, yeah, but what is it that these experienced people are so encumbered by that they're not spotting the obvious thing, which is that people want to stay in other people's homes, not hotel chains. That all hotels are modeled on the five-star model, and we're Citizen M, we didn't mention that one, but there's Citizen M hotel chain. It's challenging the way we think about hotels completely by embracing intelligent naivety. I'm going to give you some stories about what this looks like in a moment. That's the first one. How do you make fame happen? 
you create dramatic symbols of thought leadership. So in any category, there are two kinds of leadership. There's market leadership. We're the big one. Everybody knows us. We're in every bar in America. There's the thought leader. We're the one with all the new ideas, the one that's bringing you new conversations to start with your friends. Have you seen this one? Have you seen this brew dog? It comes in a squirrel. I don't know why either, but it comes in a squirrel. We're talking about it. You need to be absolutely belief-driven. So uh, you're going to hear from BrewDog in a minute about what their convictions were they, when they were starting and why they're doing uh, brands like um, The End of History. Creative in in intervention. One of the things that happens to a lot of challenge brands is they get stuck with a can't because mentality. Well, we could do that, but we really can't because we don't have the money or we don't have the know-how or we don't have the distribution or we don't have the ear of the customer. The successful brands, the ones that are really punching above their weight, adopt a can-if mentality. Well, we can if we partner in new ways. We think of it differently. I'll show you some examples of that in a moment. And resources, it's this idea of creating abundance. There are all kinds of partners and people out there from which you can go and get what you need, so long as you know how to frame it in the right way to them. Illustrations coming. This, first of all, is to get you to really pay attention to BrewDog, because that's their sales curve. You can see, phenomenal. Who's heard of BrewDog? Just quick show of hands. Yeah, some of you have. Good. So some of you have heard of this. You'll know this story really well. In many ways, it's not the freshest story. There'd be more interesting things, I think, done in America. So this is not look at those Scottish guys and learn from them. This market's done its own version of this. I brought it because I thought, A, it's, some of you won't have heard of it. B, we've actually got a film of James Watt talking. So uh, I'm going to introduce you to him right now. Our biggest mission when we set up our company, and it's still our biggest mission today, is just to make other people as passionate about great craft beer as we are, and show people there is a alternative to the mainstream, industrial, monolithic, insipid, bland, tasteless, apathetic beers that dominate the market. They spend so much money in advertising, market, and trying to convince people that's what good beer is, and sadly, so many people have fallen down this rabbit hole. We set up with no money, with no budget, and we've had to be quite inventive as to how we get our name out there. In the last five years, we've made the strongest beer on the planet. We've packaged beer in roadkill and taxidermy. We've fermented a beer at the bottom of the sea. We've made a special beer with banned substances for the Olympics, but they've all been done because it gives us a platform to get our ideas across about beer. So we made a 18.2% beer called Tokyo. There was a huge media backlash. I was in Channel 4 News. I was interviewed by loads of major newspapers. And the people that saw that coverage, maybe it just gets them starting to think, well, beer doesn't have to start with Heineken and end with Stella. There is maybe a different approach to beer and get them into good beer that way. So... Absolutely no disrespect to Heineken and Stella. That's James Watt's point of view, not mine. I like a nice Pilsner, and I've got a Heineken story coming up in a minute. But there's a lot that we can learn, I think, from BrewDog. Let's just map what they've done to our principles about how challenges succeed. So the reason he's creating End of History and putting it into uh, taxidermy, apparently it's a stoat, not a squirrel, for those of you who know your animals, um, which was roadkill, he's already dead is he wants to get people talking about his larger mission here, which is a mission that's not that novel in the US, but he, in the UK, talking about American-style craft beers, is novel, taking on the big Goliaths in that industry. is what he wants to do, and that's going to drive free publicity for him, and that's what he's really hungry for. My partner, Adam Morgan, who wrote the book, Eating the Big Fish, said, the greatest risk to a challenger is not rejection, it's indifference. We all wonder if this is going to be too much, if this story is really going to get us into trouble. And that's probably exactly where you need to be. You need to be sitting in a place of uh, uncomf uncomfort rather than risk your idea being met with the indifference of the public. So here's um, another thing about BrewDog that they did so incredibly well. You may have noticed the time frame. Launched in 2007. What happened in 2007? world's largest financial crisis ever, at least since the 30s. They are growing. They've got fans. They can't expand the business by borrowing money from the banks. The banks aren't interested in them. What do they do? They adopt some can-if thinking. We can if we borrow money from our loyal fan base. There's lots of people out there who lend us a fiver, 100 bucks a piece. 
They're now on round four of what they call equity for punks, where they borrow entirely from their own fan base. It's a crowdfunding model. They just raised 25 million pounds. They're coming to the US. They're expanding in Europe. This is how they're going to go global domination. And they've gone and created abundance. We'd like to be much more famous than we are. It's so we can only do so much with the interesting novel uh, beers that we make. But we're two characters with points of view. We're quite good on camera. We'll go to Esquire magazine. And we'll get them to, there's a Squire TV channel uh, in the UK and over here in the US. And we'll ask them to make a show about us on the road in America, going to weird places, making weird beer out of weird things. It's making them famous. So all they've got to do is show up and offer the talent, that's what they've got to offer, to a Squire magazine who've got the ability to produce the show and put it on air. Brilliant way of creating abundance, making something out of nothing, adopting candid thinking. So that's what they do. They apply their intelligent naivety to say, what has happened to beer today? There's got to be a different way to think about beer. That's the kind of intelligent naivety that drove their business to begin with. They launched Tactical Nuclear Penguin, never mind the anabolics. Everybody's talking about them. They are now famous. But they're doing it because they've got a platform about promoting better beers, interesting beers, getting people engaged with beer. They fund their growth through equity for punks. That's how they use creativity along the journey. And they go partner with Esquire TV to make sure that they're becoming more and more famous every day. These are the strategies of the challenge brand. It's all found in BrewDog. I'll give you some other for instances of this. Let's think outside of our category. Anybody here Dollar Shave Club fan? One hand, a couple of hands going up. Dollar Shave Club came from Mike Dubin. This is the founder. Put himself in his ads. Spent $4,000 on his ad. You may have seen it on YouTube. I think it's got something like 20 million views at this point. His business is now worth $600 million. And his insight came from a cocktail party conversation with a pal where they're saying, it's stupid, isn't it? What's happening to razors? They're about to bring out one that's got five in it. It's called, you have to be an astrophysicist to design these things now. My dad used to shave with a single blade razor. Oh, there's an idea, Dollar Shave Club. They make great blades, boom. Rest is history. That's intelligent naivety. What's broken? What's wrong? What's stupid? The guys from Method, if you know this brand, Method Home Care, local hero where I live in San Francisco, just sold their business for several hundred millions of dollars. They said, there's no stylish dish soap. If you'd asked the guys at Unilever, which I did 10 years ago, hey, there's no stylish dish soap. I said, what are you talking about? Nobody wants a stylish dish soap. These questions sound stupid until somebody goes and does it, gets Karim Rashid to design the thing, and now these things are being displayed in people's homes like objet d'art because it looks fabulous. They're coming out from underneath the counter, and they're right there. And now your guests are talking about it when they use the spare bathroom to wash their hands. What's that soap? It's kind of interesting. Here's another one, Lush. Who's been into a Lush? So yeah, lots of you have seen this one. So the story about Lush is very simple. Bunch of body shop executives bored at working at Anita Roddick's Green Library because the rules and regulations of how you're allowed to do things were so strict. They said, no, we're not going to do it like that anymore. We want to do it in a completely different way. Who's on fire right now? And they're looking at the likes of Whole Foods. And they're saying, you're going to Whole Foods, and it's an invasion of all your senses. It looks great. It smells great. You can pick it up. It's beautiful. Let's make soap. Let's merchandise soap in the same way that Body Shop merchandises fruits and vegetables. Gives rise to lush. And you can carve off big blocks of soap from a huge thing that's displayed like cheese. New and novel ideas. So where does intelligent naivety come from for you guys if you've been in this category for a, for a while? It comes from borrowing ideas that are on fire over there and applying to them to your category. If we overlaid the rules of makeup onto vodka, what would happen? Let's do that exercise. That's how you create a new idea. What new emotion have we not seen in this category before? You've seen James Watt putting ridiculous emotions into his brands, but there's a ton to choose from. We can do that. What if we took the conventions of the category? What does the new normal made beer look like? What if we flipped that on its head? That's going to create something new. That's going to be, create the future. As a challenger brand, you have to ask, how do we get to the future first? You have to ask not, how do we fight our pal Goliath? But how do we introduce a new criteria of choice into the category and redefine the rules of engagement? You want to race? That's how we win. Um, 
Here's a great example from the big companies. So this is the latest initiative of Pernod Ricard. So this challenger brand stuff is not a bunch of cool, hip, punky rock guys in Scotland doing it. This can be big company mantra too. Have you seen this brand? I think it's pretty new. It's called Our Vodka. And the idea is a common recipe globally around the world, common brand around the world, but brewed in locations from local ingredients. So it's a brilliant piece of engineering, I think, where they're going to get all the benefits of a global master brand, but all the benefits, too, of a local, it's our brand. So it's our Detroit, our London, our Berlin. This is from the guys at Pernod Ricard. Really interesting idea. Big data. I don't have time to make a presentation on that, but fortunately for you guys, there's some people here from Wild Fig who are going to talk to you about how you can get insight from big data. So it's not just about intelligent naivety. It's about cutting the data in different ways and looking for the trends that are just on the fringe and getting there first. So I encourage you to go see that. So we've talked about intelligent naivety. We've talked about dramatic thought leadership. I just want to touch on this idea of being uh, belief-driven and its importance to the world. Because what we're seeing from these millennials is this idea. This is paraphrasing, honestly, a dozen research uh, presentations of the moment. It's no longer just about what we buy. I'd like a nice flavored vodka, a nice artisanal bourbon. It's what we're buying into. It's what are the values of those people. Who are they? Are they Texans? I'm in Texas. I want bourbons from Texans. I actually want bourbons from not just Texas, but from my location in Houston. I want to know who these guys are. Did they go to college like me? Are they into the environment like I am? There are all kinds of ways that you can present your brand to the world as asking people to buy into your own philosophy, your own value system. Uh, this made a big stink. REI, who's been in the outdoor business for a long time, I'm sure you're all familiar with this brand, uh, but at Black Friday last, in 2015, this is the uh, day after Thanksgiving when all the retailers go into profit, at least if they've been running their brands well, and REI said, no, we're going to close our stores on Black Friday. Because actually, what we believe in, more importantly than anything else, is people going outside. And it's a holiday. And don't spend it at home. Go run off the turkey, hike off the turkey, get outside. And of course, it's a provocative point of view. So it got them all over the news. So there's a piece of famous thought leadership happening here around a belief system that's been true to that brand from the very beginning. And authenticity, I'm sure if you haven't heard that word already, we're going to be talking about that today as well. So that's an example of leading with your beliefs having conviction, and using it provocatively. It doesn't have to be serious like REI. Newcastle Brown Ale was a client of ours. That brand had lost its way in the US and was not doing particularly well until we asked them to say, what's the true story of Newcastle? And we went all the way back to Newcastle upon Tyne in the northeast of the UK where the Geordies live. And we've put them in working men's clubs and had them talk to these people. And they said, you know, these are really honest people. What would they think about some of this new normal that we're talking about? And one of the guys said, you know, I was in a bar in New York, and I went into the toilet there, the restroom, and I'm doing my business, and I'm walking out having done, and this guy hands me a towel. I said, that's kind of, he said, you know what would happen if somebody handed me a towel in a restroom at home? He said, this has just gone out of control. So they decided to make a stand against pretentiousness. And all of the pretentiousness we see in the world, which is why the new tagline, Newcastle, no bollocks, is true to that brand. It allows them to become famous. And it's given them a point of view for the first time in the US that they can play with in lots of fun ways. So when Stella runs ads that say it's a chalice, not a glass, what does that look like to a brand that has a strong point of view? Exactly, it looks like this. It causes all kinds of trouble. Indifference is the enemy. Right? Indifference, this is, this is, you cannot be indifferent to this. And it caused a bit of a wildfire for them. So getting clear on what it is you believe so that you're making decisions about how to be radical in these ways, in ways that feel true to who you are, and that are going to be defensible in the world. Can of thinking. This is the enemy of any challenger. It's certainly the enemy, I suspect, of anybody who wants to succeed in the new normal in this category. We can't do that because. It's never been done before. People won't like it. The retailers will reject. Well, well let's get into Caniff mentality. A couple of stories on this. If you are Reebok and you spent 20 years trying to compete with Nike and fail time after time, the can't because mentality is alive and well. But there's a courageous new team there right now that's saying we can compete with Nike if 
We go to those places where Nike doesn't bother. So the Spartan races, the CrossFit gyms, the fringy kind of boxes on the edge of town where Nike doesn't show up, that's where we will win. We can compete with Nike if we go there. Here's a great, this is a great story about Heineken in France. So Heineken in France was the number two brand to Cronenberg 1664 for year after year after year. And the two brands were locked in a race the way that two big beer brands compete with each other, TV advertising. The French government, in their wonderful socialist wisdom, said, we are banning beer commercials on TV. Now, you could freak out. You could, we can't because we're kind of stuck now because we can't do... Or you could lean into the opportunity created by that challenge, by that constraint, as Heineken France did, and say, well, we can if we really commit to every single piece of secondary and tertiary packaging innovation that Heineken Center introduces. So they were the first to do those kegs. They were first into the aluminum bottles. And they've changed their fortunes. The French TV guide said, you're not allowed to use people in advertising. There's probably a way we can work around that, we said. We can if we make the bottle openers look like people. And they've become number one in uh, France as a consequence of all this innovation. So it's not just about little guys against big guys. It's big guys adopting a challenger mindset. Here's a nice story from a furniture startup. So this is a brand called Made. It's a little bit like Etsy, if you're familiar with that, but Etsy for furniture. They've got a business online, it's growing really well, and they're at the point in their history where they need to show up at the most prestigious furniture show in Milan. Except it's going to cost them a fortune in slotting fees to get in there. How do we do that? How can we show in Milan when we can't afford the fees? The answer is, you find your customers in Milan, you call them up, you say, can we bring 30 journalists to your home and eight other people who are also uh, bought furniture from made in Milan, can we put a bus, bus tour together and take people around homes? Guess who got all the coverage for being the most innovative way to display? A brand that didn't display on the floor, East Alloni, but that used some can if thinking to create abundance for itself, right? So I'm sure they rewarded those customers very handsomely, but it was great for everybody concerned. And this is this can if mentality. How can I create abundance? How can I get access to resources that I don't normally think I have. So part of the Newcastle Brown Ale project was, we want to go on the Super Bowl, they said. How nice, we said. Your marketing budget doesn't even buy you 10 seconds. All of it. How are you going to get on the Super Bowl? So they started a campaign that said, hey, little brands out there, who'd like to go on the Super Bowl with us? They pushed this in social media. They got their fans sharing it. They ended up with 37 brands. Um, I don't have the commercial to share you in the interest of time, but Google it. It's hysterical. It's the spokespeople trying to get 37 different brands into a 60-second commercial to run the Super Bowl. And it made them famous. Not just the spot itself, but the build-up and the post. They won the Super Bowl in 2014 from an advertising point of view. Um, so one story to close this with, and it's another example from outside of the category. Uh, so I went to visit the uh, CEO of American Giant, uh, American Giant is a startup apparel brand based in San Francisco. And their mission is to bring back American manufacturing. So it's all made from cotton grown in the Carolinas. They've got their own factories there. And to make a hoodie that's just indestructible, that's the kind of garment that would last 20 years. And in some ways, hearing him talk reminded me of the new normal, because he's talking about the opportunities that exist for little guys taking on big guys, for doing something with craft and care and attention to get the interest and heart and energy of a consumer and using their willingness to advocate to grow a brand. So I'll let him have the final word on this, and then we'll, we'll move on. Like it or not, when you enter into a, a category like apparel or sweatshirt, it's massive categories with the biggest bullies in the block kind of all around you. Um, uh, you sort of marinate in that idea of being a challenger brand, right? That whole idea about saying, you know, you, you have to come in and uh, be nimble and be um, uh, almost punk rock in your point of view was, was fundamental to starting the business. It's what, it's what gave us confidence to start the business in a lot of ways, right? There's this one point, this rejection of the status quo in the big 
coupled with this sort of unbridled optimism and sense that I can go do that now. And that kind of um, change maker quality is incredibly exciting. And I think there's so much happening there, particularly in the Bay Area, where you have all of these people that really are, to your point, thinking, oh, I can do that. This little guy is connected to all of these things around quality and craft and transparency and all those things that are opening up um, great change in the market and great opportunity in the market. And um, I think when you can get that relationship building, it's just interesting. The brands, brands that do that well, uh, the pace of growth can be just staggering. So I'll let uh, Bayard Winthrop, which is a great name, by the way, isn't it, for a guy who runs a sweatshirt business, Bayard Winthrop closed the comment. You know, 10, 20 years ago, when there not, wasn't a new normal, it was really difficult to change the dynamic in an industry and to launch a challenger brand and succeed. In the new normal, where there's so much openness and willingness on behalf of the customer, on behalf of the consumer, and with entrepreneurs in the world able to do this kind of thing, it's just a phenomenal time to be a challenger brand. And I know that many of you will find yourself in that situation, think of yourself, and I hope I've been able to provide you with a few ways to think about how to seize that opportunity with both hands this morning. I'm running a workshop at 11 o'clock. If anybody's interested in talking about this further, uh, we will do it then. I won't take any Qs and offer any As at this point, because I'd like to get a couple of other characters uh, onto the stage with me. So we've seen the trends this morning uh, from our friends at Nielsen about how much change is coming and what it looks like. I presented you with some kind of ways to think about how to win in the new normal by being a challenger brand, by pursuing challenger brand strategies. I think it's time that we heard from the customer now. So I'm going to welcome on stage to me in a minute. Just let me introduce them, and then we'll give them a nice uh, big round of applause. These two guys are legends in the industry. I got a, a, a chance to spend some time with them uh, last night. We have Sandy Block, who's the VP of Beverages at Legal Seafoods, representing the on-premise customer's point of view about how to win in the new normal. And Doug Bell from Whole Foods, who's the global beverage buyer. I'd like to introduce, warm welcome please to both those guys. They're going to introduce, uh, join me on stage now. Come on up, gents. <laughs> So we're going to make this bit, because you've seen so many slides and so many presentations already this morning, we're going to make this uh, very conversational, which I think uh, suits uh, both these guys, because they're both good conversationalists. Sure. And I'm going to give you um, just an opportunity to, to talk for a few minutes. I'm going to start with, with you, Sandy, about... Um, just tell us what the new normal looks like when it shows up in legal seafoods. And if you've got two or three anecdotes, stories about what you see that's working and winning, that these guys who are now primed to be magpies and they're going to steal these insights and ideas and take them and apply them to their business, what does the new normal look like? What's, what's working out there? Well, first of all, I'm from Boston where we know how to pronounce Napper and Sonoma correctly. <laughs> but I am originally from London, so... Just to clarify. Good. Um, so a couple of quick anecdotes. I was at a bar about two months ago and uh, got into a conversation with the bartender. And he put together a fantastic Manhattan for me. It happened to be with Basil Hayden. And hadn't been back to the bar for about seven weeks. Walked into the bar last week. Bartender pointed at me as I was about five feet away, said, Mr. Block, Basil Hayden, Manhattan. Mm. And that just, imagine how that makes you feel. Um, I think the big insight for me there is that one of the aspects of the new normal for me is how cookie cutter and robotic service and um, one size fits all is out and how customized service where there's a really great interaction with whether it's a bartender or a waiter or a waitress really changes the experience tremendously. Mm -hmm. And um, another thought that I had was one of the, uh, one of the amazing things to me about, uh, about the on-premise sector is that uh, today it strikes me that particularly with the millennial consumer, but pretty much with everybody, 
it's not so much, I sort of have a slightly different perspective, I think. It's not so much about the brand as what you're drinking, where you're drinking it. So here, here's another quick story that uh, I was doing some research at a bar uh, not far from one of our stores. I was looking at what people are charging for liquor and uh, some popular drinks. Yes, I do spend a lot of time in bars. <laughs> and uh, it's one of the great <laughs> things about my job. And uh, I sat down at this bar. I usually order wine there, but I ordered a Grey Goose martini. The bartender smiled and said, we don't carry Grey Goose. And I said, OK, this is going to sound even a little bit stranger. I will have a Patron margarita. I'm going to switch from vodka to, to um, tequila. Bartender said, uh, we actually don't carry Patron. And at this point, I was like, OK, what do you carry? I'll have a kettle one. Two minutes later, gentleman sat down to my right, ordered a Grey Goose martini, and <laughs> could not have scripted this any more dramatically. He was told also, we don't carry that, and he was very fine with it. And then, yes, three minutes after that, a woman sat down on my left, and she ordered a Patron margarita, and was very comfortable with the fact that they didn't have Patron either. So with this, the light bulb that went off there to me is it's a lot of it has to do with where you are. Mm. The drinks that you're ordering will define you, but also where you're drinking them. And uh, so those, those two aspects to me were, were really significant in terms of my understanding of this new world that we're in. Great. I have a couple of follow-up questions, but I want to uh, get you to tell your version of this, Doug. What's a couple of stories about the new normal in Whole Foods? You know, I think that you know, for the audience here, you, you really need to stress your authenticity, um, have transparency in that, uh, as well as quality, and know your audience. Um, an example, I had a, a cider maker come and present to me, and he's like, oh, this is perfect for Whole Foods. We, crea we created this just seeing it on the shelf in your store, and I asked him for an ingredients list, and uh, he had high fructose corn syrup in it, and we don't allow that in our stores. And I'm like, buddy, you should have just gone to our website, and it's got a list of what we allow and what we don't allow. So, you know, really know your audience. Um, I was approached by uh, a brand of spirits that was developed by bartenders for bartenders, and, and they came and presented to me, and I, I just took a couple of hours with them, and after about an hour into the presentation, I realized they were presenting to someone that tends bar or owns a bar, not someone in the retail establishment. And I, I think I ended up spending half the day with them to just walk them through the approach of selling their product to a retailer. Right. Because, you know, our audience is the same. You know, mine just consumes it when they get home. Yeah. You know, and it's Andy's consumer. They have it right there, you know, on the spot. But authenticity is just, it's key right now. So let, let, the follow-up is probably the same for both of you then, which is in the new normal with this explosion of choice and so on, well, actually what's been elevated, the importance of, is of knowledge, of knowing. So what, what was happening to you there was the guy going, I know that what's going to make me uh, successful as a bartender is going to be recognizing Mr. Buck when he walks in and knowing his drink. And then when I don't have the one he wants, being able to talk to him about a different uh, option, knowledgeably, and so on. So what do you do, Sandy, to educate the people that work there? And it'd be the same question for you, too, Doug, about the, the, the guys who, who, who um, build the shelves for you at Whole Foods. What are you doing to make sure that they know the backstories, the authenticity, the look, whatever it is? What are you doing? How do you train people? I'm going to go back to uh, what Doug said. To me, it's uh, authenticity, that the product is real, that it's memorable, that it has a story attached to it, that it wasn't just sort of manufactured, uh, and, uh, and that it has some, uh, something memorable about it. And I have found that uh, you know, most of my delivery system are millennials. Most of them are uh, younger people. And I found that they, are, they have a very, very uh, high level, a very low tolerance for bullshit. You know, mm -hmm. the, the bullshit detector is up there, so mm -hmm. they, they, they really want to know what is this product made of and, um, and what's behind it. And when you convey that story and you give them skills to be able to describe it in non-technical language in a very short, succinct uh, expression, 
I think they embrace it because they, uh, they, they try the product and they believe in it and then they, then they become advocates for it. So yeah. it's huge, huge, different type of education than when I first started in the business, which was all about technical information. Uh, I think now it's, it's, it's more about the, uh, the people that created it, uh, the materials that were used. You know, it's not about fermentation temperatures or distillation techniques. About the story behind it, what's, what's the same thing in Whole Foods or different? Yeah, we, um, we, we train our team members at the store level, also at the regional level. Um, we, have a, we have a buying structure that's probably, I know it's different than any other grocer in the U.S., where you have on my team global buyers. We're sort of looking at the business from 38,000 feet. And then in each of our 11 regions, we have a regional beverage buyer um, keen to local products like our buyer in the Mid-Atlantic buying wines from Virginia and Maryland. And then in each store, we have a buyer who knows their neighborhood. Mm. Um, and we train on all levels. Um, that being said, if, if you think about, and all we're talking about here is millennials, and that's cool. Boomer's still got a lot of money. Yes, but, you know, our research shows us that the millennial, they're very fickle. You know, you, you can fool them once, but you can't fool them twice. They can see, like you said, they see right through bullshit, yeah. right through it. Uh, you know, and if, if you look at branded product as we know it, as boomers, I would be scared right now if I were one of those big branded California wineries. I would be really afraid because millennials aren't going down that path. They're really not. And if you look at, you look at other industries like the autom automobile industry, you know, Mercedes-Benz, for them to bring in a car they can sell for $29,000, they're betting the farm that that millennial is going to buy the same car as parents drive. Right. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. Maybe they buy a Honda. I don't know. It's, it's a gamble. Right. But last night when we were, we were chatting, you were telling the Kendall Jackson story, which I think was interesting about, you know, the role in your store for... Uh, the kind of novelty section where I'm sure. hunting for the new, and then the safe section where I definitely know that will work. What's, how, do, how do you navigate those, the mix between those in your stores? Well, you know, there, and it's funny that you mentioned Kendall Jackson, because in its price point, it has stayed constant and grown since introduced 20 years ago. Mm. It's like the only California Chardonnay in that price point that's done that. And I think that, you know, they're going to capture new customers by stressing their sustainability, sustainability messaging, um, and that's actually something we need more of. But, but I see bigger, bigger brands like, and I don't want to slam any here, but like Woodbridge and some of these. I, the millennials aren't going there. Yeah. They're just not. Well, let's, let's talk about this, because I think it was implied in the, in the Nielsen slides where they talked about how much value had been brought into the category by the premiumization of it. What are you seeing happening in, in, in legal seafoods in terms of price points of wine at the bar, but you know, beers, beers and spirits too? Yeah, I don't think uh, price is a huge barrier today. I mean, that could change, change major league in 2008 and 2009. What I'm seeing is the major trend uh, that cuts across all demographics, uh, but certainly is probably driven a little bit by, by millennials, is that flavor is in, and maybe even extreme flavor in all the categories. I mean, IPAs, this is no news to, I'm sure, most of you. IPAs are just exploding. Uh, the more hoppy, the better. Um, same thing in the, uh, in the spirit category, mezcal which you could not give away five years ago, <laughs> is now the hottest thing out there. Mm. Uh, bourbon, obviously a strong flavored beverage. And in the, so it's perceived flavor, and in the wine category, Sauvignon Blanc, which um, obviously being seafood purveyors, uh, we sell a lot of Sauvignon Blanc, but that is overtaken Chardonnay in many of our, uh, many of our venues. And um, uh, there's nothing wrong with Chardonnay, but I think it's perceived flavor is not as, uh, as dramatic, uh, at least among some, some thought leaders. Mm. Uh, certainly any restaurants that have uh, sommeliers, uh, you know, they're not pushing Chardonnay. Um, but I think it's strong, it, uh, perceived flavor is in and perceived blandness is out category. I mean, anybody remember we used to sell some Merlot in the United States. Mm. Uh, that's, you know, that's starting to come back a little bit, but yep. it's, it definitely dropped Shiraz, things like that. So that, that, that's my take on 
what uh, consumers are telling me. Do you, uh, question for, for both of you, and I think you can, you can start. Do you, this, this notion of trends and spotting them and getting on, where are these trends coming from? And are you guys feeding it and making it happen? Or are you responding to stuff that you just have your antenna up for and you're spotting as it goes? How, how does that work? What's the mechanism? You know, I think that we all like to think of ourselves as trendsetters, and it's really hard to, it's hard to define. You know, if you look at, in terms of price points, in sales right now, and this was mentioned last night in the opening reception. Premiumization is in. If you look at big retailers like us and Trader Joe's and Kroger and Safeway, whatever, our opening price point wines, those $2.99, $3.99, they're dead in the water, mm. completely dead in the water. Which means that people are trading up, you know, and it's, if you, if you look at some research, I don't know if it's IRI or Nielsen's where I saw it, but a millennial will spend twice as much as a boomer for a bottle. So if the boomer's buying, you know, our average price point ranges depending on holiday and seasonality, but we're at about 13 bucks a bottle average, mm. which I think the grocery standard is about nine, so we're skewing up there. But they, they want a better quality. They want it to taste better as well. I mean, just the, the quality you get from 10 to $30 is just amazing, especially an imported wine, yeah. which is a huge driver for us, old world. Do you think some of this is being driven by this, you know, this, this mindset that they bring and these behaviors that they bring where, you know, one minute they might be trying a really interesting smoky bourbon in a bar late at night, and they bring that palate. That palate has been changed by that experience. Hmm. The hoppiness of the IPA, the, you know, the palate has been changed by that experience. They're bringing those uh, different taste buds, I suppose, to everything that they consume, and it's, it's all changing each other. It's all influencing each other. Yeah, I think the, I think the discovery piece is huge, too. Mm. Um, we do a couple of LTOs every year uh, with different wine regions or wine categories. And I was really kind of surprised that at, at how strong the response, at probably the strongest response to any category we've done was to South Africa. Mm. And uh, I think people like the story, they like the wines, but I, it was also being able to introduce their guests to something that was not totally mainstream. Mm. Uh, we did a program with Italy where the wines were equally as good and it didn't, wasn't nearly as, as popular because uh, there was less of that discovery feel like everyone knows Italian wines. Yeah. So I think there's something that, something to the fact of getting the sales force, the people on the floor, or, you know, in my case, people who are uh, wait staff, to get excited about something and kind of own it and, and buy into the story whatever the category is. We, we actually have a lot of proprietary spirits and proprietary wines that we, we really believe in, and they love that because that's something that uh, they Obviously, can... for instance. So, so we, we craft uh, a Pinot Noir with a winemaker from Sonoma. We, we have a, a Malbec with a producer from uh, Argentina. Uh, it doesn't say our name on it. It's not like legal seafoods Pinot Noir, but it's... Mm -hmm. It's, it's, a, it's something that we are the only ones that carry. And the staff loves that. They, they just love that feeling of, they, first of all, they feel proud that we're not just kind of laying back and you know, letting products come to us, but that we're actually going out and uh, in some cases selecting our own 10-year-old bourbon with one of the distilleries, um, things like that. So I think to me, it's, to me a lot of the, uh, the answer to this is in motivating and getting your delivery system excited about something and then they tell that story, they convey that enthusiasm and, um, and they're able to uh, engage the guests that way, engage mm -hmm. the customer that way. Yeah. So sometimes it's not totally predictable. Yeah, so I'm going to come, come back to that as well, but I just want to hear the, what the Whole Foods perspective, or yours anyway, is on how you use, leverage, feed this notion of discovery when people are coming into Whole Foods. How big a part of it is that? You know, we're, in, in retail, it's, it's really advantageous for the retailer to bring a new product to market, having a first to market, having something new constantly on your shelves lends to discovery. It's sort of, Whole Foods maybe is sort of like a treasure hunt in terms of seasonality, local produce, things like that, you know, the first to have this in season. Same thing with, with beverages. Mm. For instance, um, 
Ben Parson is a winemaker. He's got a winery in Denver and just opened one in Austin. He's got a company called the Infinite Monkey Theorem. The and Infinite? The Infinite Monkey Theorem. It's okay. wine in a can. <laughs> it's so 250 milliliter. It comes in a four pack. You know, he, uh, I've met with him two or three times in the past two years thinking, you know, can, a can is like the perfect delivery system for liquid. And we do it in beer and you know soft drinks, whatever. And he's like, let's let's get it in wine. Right. So that's and we we brought we brought it to market this past spring, and our customers loved it. So they what's the price point on that? It's about uh, thirteen ninety nine. Hmm. For how, how many? No. Four two hundred. So it's a liter of wine, and the quality of the wine is good. Hmm. Um, we're bringing to market. One as well, a proprietary label in about eight weeks. It's Prosecco, it can't be called Prosecco because in Prosecco you can't put it in a can, it has to be in glass. Oh, they have rules so it's the that. same grape, the glare of grape, but uh, we, we think it's gonna be a hit. You know, that's, that's discovery. It's, it's giving our customers something they haven't seen before, yeah. or maybe turning them on to something they've never tried, like wines from South Africa. We did a big promotion about 20 months ago. And we saw a lot of wine, and it, it moved, if you looked at Nielsen's data, it moved the South African category up 50% in the United States for nine weeks. And then, of course, it dropped off. But now we've got re repeat customers coming in. It's, it's a viable category now. The same thing with rosé. You know, five years ago, Americans would drink rosé from Memorial Day to Labor Day, like our, our Brit cousins, right? Now it's a category all to itself. It's a discovery category, um, and our customer wants to spend exactly twenty to twenty-five dollars for that bottle of rosé. Mm -hmm. This is pink wine, yeah, in a twenty-five dollar ring. Yeah, so, but, but it's discovery. They they've discovered rosé, and we kind of helped them do that. So, in in a sense, have we cr we've created a monster here, right? We've created mm -hmm. a customer whose attention span is very small. Mm -hmm. They'll be into the South African thing. But not the Italian thing, because it's everybody's heard of Italian wines. You know, my yeah. friends come round for uh, for dinner at my house. I want to be serving a South African wine. They've never had that before. I had it at Legal Seafoods. They've got this proprietary blend. The mm. whole thing is cre we've created these attention spans of, that are very short, and it's creating this kind of kind of boom and bust mm. cycle quite mm. quickly. That doesn't really bother you, does it? Because so, you know, it's all growing the category for you guys. Right. If you're a brand owner, though, what, what's your point of view on this? You're glad you're up on this side of the table, I suppose, and not that one, or yeah. do you see opportunity out there for these guys? I think that uh, any brand owner who is um, thinking about the future of their brand needs to figure out how to get to that person who is on the front lines and, um, and going to be talking about it. And um, everyone, in the, everyone that works for him, we have 2,000 waiters, waitresses, bartenders, but uh, every one of them has a handful of favorites in whatever the category is. Uh, wine, spirits, beers that are, uh, you know, go-to for them and that stick out in their minds so that when they're given that trust by the guests to what do you recommend, they'll give, hopefully we'll give some alternatives, but you know, it's, uh, it, it, it can be done, it is being done, and I would say that um, you know, brands that are, that are forward thinking are figuring out how to impact that demographic that we've been talking about so much uh, today, the millennial generation, because um, they do have, as that Nielsen slide showed, they do have a lot of influence over what the guest is, uh, a lot of power. is drinking. And to what degree do you allow the producers and the brand folks to get exposure to the people who are on the front lines dealing with people? Do you, is that something, no, we, we don't allow that to happen, or you're, you're wide open for, hey, you want to throw an event to educate and stuff? How does I, it work? I, we never allow incentives, because to me that's putting the wrong agenda in the mind of the, uh, of the uh, waiter, waitress, bartender, but Education, totally, totally, uh, we encourage it, and we do have people coming in all the time to uh, do tastings and things like that. But we, we don't run contests on how much brand X you can sell. Yeah. Because to me, that's a uh, conflict of interest. If you really want to find the, the right um, 
the right product for each individual guest's palate, what they're interested in, and not, uh, not have people kind of pushing something that doesn't fit that. But on the, on the education side, we, uh, we encourage it. So when these guys come in and they're doing a tasting, presumably, if they all just stand there and put this as a Sauvignon Blanc, it's slightly grassy flat. I mean, they've heard that a thousand times from everyone. Who's, who's done something that is, do you think, legitimate and interesting in that venue space? Either of you can answer. Um, well, we've been talking a lot about local. Yeah. And uh, most of our restaurants are in New England, and we've had, uh, we've had some visits up to Allagash, which mm. is in Maine. It really sticks out in the, in the uh, sort of alpha bartender's mind. Uh, so actually having an interaction with the production is helpful. Uh, so in whatever market you're in. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, some of our wine purveyors that have done a really good job have uh, gone beyond, here's the tannin level, here's the pH, and you know, stuff like that, and really talk about the food interactions and, and uh, actually gone as far as, you know, having the kitchen prepare some uh, a dish that works particularly well with, the, with, with one of the wines that they're doing. So that aha moment, so right. things like that. So giving a little story the to The experience, possibly. the same experience that you want the guests to have, if you have it, you can translate it better. Got it, yeah. You know, Mark, you know, just sitting here and listening to you, Sandy, you know, it's, if you're a supplier, you really need to change the way you do business, the way you present your product to market to guys like us. You know, I, I forget who I was speaking with, maybe it was wine enthusiasts or some, somebody. I'm like, you know, these large suppliers, they come in, they sit down, they do a PowerPoint, <laughs> they show a shiny label, they give a Parker score, and then they walk out the door. And you know, millennials don't give a flying rat's ass about a number, they don't. They'd rather have a recommendation from their older brother or sister or whatever, their friend, their pal. And you know, it's, it's almost to the point where I don't even want to meet with suppliers that do that. You know, the big ones, they've done it the same way. They dress the exact same way. You can spot them from five miles away. Yep, that's a wine sales rep. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. a supplier rep. Yeah. Yeah. Do figure out another way to do business to catch my eye. Because if you catch my eye and Sandy's eye, you catch our team's eye, and then suddenly, our team members are promoting your product on our floor or in our cold box or we're pouring your product at one of our venues. I teach a uh, course at Boston University on the history of wine and I always, uh, you, I always assign for one of the weeks a heavy reading course, it's a graduate course, uh, The Emperor of Wine, which is the biography of Parker. And I have enormous respect for Robert mm. Parker, but I want people to, I want mostly millennial students in my classes to understand how we've evolved and how recent our involvement with wine is. And usually the comment from most of the students after they read the book is, how come we used to be so stupid? Mm. Like, why didn't we listen mm. to this guy? And then you don't have to set the context that we mm. were in a wine drinking country and he has a great palate and blah, blah, blah. But, but I totally agree with, with, uh, with your comment. The, the, the scores are not relevant to that demographic. So let me, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to gi ask you a question and, and ask you to answer it right away, give you a moment to think about it while I tell a little story. And then, but I want to make sure we give you guys the opportunity to ask some questions here. So we do have some mics. Uh, yeah, people are wandering around with mics. If you have a question, this is a great opportunity. You've got two very powerful buyers here. Uh, ask them tough questions. Um, so my question to you guys is just to make a prediction before we leave the stage today, and we, we might do it at the very end as closing thoughts after you've had some questions about you know, this idea that, yes, we know what the new normal looks like now. Nielsen set up for us the fact that the new normal is constantly changing. Just to make a prediction or two about where you think it might go so the entrepreneurs out there can jump on it and be the first to it. So <laughs> in the background, background memory, be processing that one. But to your point, you know, one of the things I wanted to highlight, which I'm glad you, you both have made this point, um, reminds me of, uh, I recently saw Maria Stipp, who's the CEO of Lagunitas, on a stage similar to this one, talking about uh, the audience. And she was talking about how they deal very differently with, with the trade. And I think one of the takeaways from this, as much as I spoke about how to design brands to appeal to the consumer, clearly the gatekeeper is these guys and their stuff, and figuring out the way to tell the story to them in a way that really captures their imagination, excites them, 
is probably the first step. So you're thinking beyond to the consumer, but you're thinking first about the gatekeepers here. But Maria Stipp told this story about, um, you know, how come Lagunitas is so successful and so on. She said that uh, they recently, they, you, I'm sure know, they've, uh, a big chunk of them been bought by Heineken recently, and it's given them access to all kinds of new retail opportunities. Mm. And the retailer was saying, so now that you're you know, playing with the big boys, we're going to need to put on a promotion. It's going to need to know what your um, in-aisle display is going to look like. And, yet, and she said, yeah, we don't do any of that. You don't do any of that, but all the other vendors do exactly that. Yeah, we, we don't do any of that. Now, we have a uh, charity fund, and we will, we will fund any charity, make a donation to any charity you're interested in, and that's the way that we spend this money. We don't spend it in that way, the way everybody else spends it. We spend it in this way. And we know it costs us some sense of exposure and so on, but that's the kind of business we are. Now, you can imagine how electrified some of the staff were by that story, and it got them on their side and so on. So just rethinking not just the consumer experience of the brand, but the customer's experience of the brand and how you engage with them is a big opportunity. So any questions from the audience? Yes, down here. Um, some of the, at the beginning, some of the brands and some of the new normal looked like really stupid products. <laughs> and they, they didn't look appealing. And how do you tell the difference between something that is simply trying so hard to be novel that it's dumb and something that's inventive and going to have legs? Great question. How do you know? Because all ideas like that look weird to begin with. I mean, one of the things that the Nielsen data showed is that rolling out of endless new brands, and that to me is uh, a consistent strategy, uh, particularly among liquor companies, mm. where they'll just come up with anything, throw it against the wall. Growth is going to come from new placements, and that's the job that distributors do. They get these new, new flavors of vodka, new flavors of rum, new flavors of tequila out there. And then they say, well, you know, if it sells, it sells. And if it doesn't, they move on to the next, the, they come up with the next product in the lab for the next year. So, I, I mean, the only way to answer that question for me, maybe Doug has a more intelligent answer, is um, just based on experience, you know, stay away from fads and, and mm -hmm. uh, use your experience and judgment uh, to determine, does something have legitimacy? I mean, that's part of what we're paid for is to make those judgments. And, we're not 100 percent. I'm not 100 percent right. Before we let you go, you're going to take the next guy that walks in with a grapefruit flavored something or other. Uh, no, I, I, we tend to be a little bit cautious. We, you know, we're not the uh, venue that breaks new ground in that regard. So um, we're probably a little bit more conservative because we have, you know, 34 different restaurants. They're 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 all different, but uh, none of them are that cutting edge that people are coming in looking for whipped cream. Uh, Smoke salmon vodka. So you're, you're the guy that's going to wait and see if it take, catches fire bit. or if it just turns out to be a dumb idea. A little bit. I, I think generally, I mean, in, I'm not a good person to answer this because people don't bring totally weird things to us. I know they bring them to you, though, Doug. Yeah. yeah. You know, a lot, yeah. a lot of it is instinct. You just, you just, you have to know your customer. And you know, there's like, there's, a, there's an art to what we do. And we've been in taking those art classes our whole life, if, if you want to put it like that. I mean, Ten years ago, I was brought a concept by the wine group, second largest wine company in the world, and they showed it to me, and I said, oh, that's not going to sell. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. It's a brand called Cupcake, and it's five million <laughs> cases in there. So I missed that opportunity to take that to market. That's okay. We carry the wines. It sells well. It's a price point. Quality's good. They brought me one two years ago to look at, and the packaging is it's perfect. It's a brand called Chloe, right? C-H-L-O-E. The label's white. It's got a little black band around it. It looks like a box of Chanel number no. five, right? Like, you got a winner there. And, and taking a playbook from the, the advertising firm that brought Absolute to market in the 80s, you know, somebody told them, hey, go drop three cases of that at every gay bar in San Francisco and you'll have a brand. And you know what? They did. So our recommendation to the wine group was take that Chloe and drop a case of that Pinot Grigio off at every hair and nail salon in Beverly Hills and Palm Beach and Palm Springs and Manhattan and you got a brand and bam. 
it's a million cases a year now. You just know, you know, you know if it's going to sell or not. Well, do you remember on the cupcake thing? we will love another question in a minute, but on the cupcake thing, do you know, what was it that made you go, that's not going to work? Oh, the, the packaging I thought was poor, mm. very, very busy label, you know, it's, Again, it was prototype. You know, they said, well, do you like this label or this label or this label? I'm like, I don't really like any of them. I think the name's stupid. <laughs> and it's actually named after a gentleman that works in their office at the winery. His nickname is Cupcake. That's fantastic. That would have been yeah, a better story. His first name is Craig, if any of you all know Craig. That would have been a better story. Any other questions? Yes. Just, just one. I was struck by your uh, description of wine salesman, Doug. Mm -hmm. um, after having attended WSWA for 30 years, I think I can spot those same people. But how do you gentlemen react to metric-driven sales presentations? I was reflecting on the Nielsen conversation earlier. When you have folks coming in and say, okay, it's going to do this many turns, it's going to reduce this kind of SKU profitability, how do you guys react to those? Okay, I want to answer that right quick because this is fresh in my mind. I was at our corporate offices two weeks ago in Austin, and I met with the uh, Fetzer Bonterra people. They're the largest organic winery in America. They do a great job. They, they walk the walk and talk the talk for 30 years now, right? Sit down with my rep. She's a national chain accounts lady. She's got an hour, right, with my team. And she spends 40 minutes looking at IRI Nielsen's data, which we look at every single day. And finally, I just said, hey, Penny, when are you going to sell us some wine? We see all these, these, this data, we see all these metrics, we know what price points are good. Sell us some wine, tell us your story, give us your, you know, your, your environmental footprint, give me some numbers like that, you know, what can we do together? Don't show me numbers, we, we know those numbers, we look at them all the time. That sounds like a brand, I mean, I, I don't want to cr criticize, but it sounds like a brand that's not clear about its belief system, right? Because they are, you, I, even yeah. I know that about them. Yeah. Where's that story coming forward? It came at the very end of her presentation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Doug's a much sure. nicer guy than I am. Uh, with me, it's a very quick conversation. It's quick. <laughs> yeah, I think, okay. More questions, good. It's not every day you get to speak to these two guys, so I'm going to take advantage of it. Um, we're a seven-year-old winery in Nashville, Tennessee. We're a social entrepreneur-driven winery. Our money, our profit has gone toward restoring an old uh, 1820 home mansion, and now we bought another mansion on the um, National Registered Endangered List, and we're going to do preservation through wine. And Nashville is about to have wine and grocery stores yes. in July. So I'd like to ask you if yeah. we can partner with you in preserving <laughs> this old uh, mansion. Is he pitching? Is, uh, are you pitching? <laughs> sure, let's talk after. Uh, All right, that sounds great. Thank you. <laughs> no, I love that. Take advantage to pitch. Yes, another question back there. A couple uh, more, and then we'll have these guys close it for us with their statements. Good. Thanks. Uh, uh, my question is to Doug, and I wanted to uh, go back to the cupcake example that you mentioned before. Uh, for a trade like the wine industry, which is notorious for pushing issues such as terroir and um, uh, selling the, uh, the product qualities, how do you encourage promoters and distributors to change their manner of selling products when the customer, I, in my 20 years distributing and promoting wines, never asked me once for a wine with terroir? How is it that we're uh, enforcing and reinforcing these practices instead of recognizing products like Cupcake for what they are as something that's appealing? Well, it's like I said, you know, authenticity plays a big role in everything that we buy, pretty much. Um, we, we try to tell that story to our regional buyers and our team members at the store level. We encourage distributors to do that as well. Something that I've seen just in, in being in this business a long time. And I don't deal with a lot of distributors one-on-one -on -one because we have stores in two countries and 40 states, roughly. I deal more with the supplier level, but you know, the distributors need to, in my opinion, go back to doing what they used to do, that's selling wine, not just taking orders. You know? And the, the distributor sales rep, they need to have a higher level of knowledge as well so that they can share that with the people that work in our stores, as well as the consumer if they're in the stores pouring or sampling. But it's, it's less about, I mean, sure, knowledge of 
terroir and the technical mm. aspects of it, but it's knowledge of the story that that, that mm. I mean, you know, you, you have a story. You're trying to preserve old buildings through selling wine. That's different and distinct in the marketplace. Mm. It's that as well, isn't it? And, and mm. having an energy and a passion for Bonterra's mm. environmental story 30 years True. in the making, not right. just here's the data and here's the pro mm. flavor profile or whatever. Mm. You concur? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I think that uh, every every restaurant, every grocery, every retail is is a different brand, and each has their own uh, level of interest in some of the things that you were talking about or, or lack of interest in it. When I uh, when I talk to my staff, I tell them that we're going to give you the uh, you know what you're going to reveal to the guest is the tip of the iceberg. We're going to give you the whole iceberg. You understand how this is constructed. You understand what this is made of. Guest doesn't care about it. You're going to boil it down into a 30-second yeah. at most, because that's the attention span uh, soundbite for the guest. But terroir, I think, is important to people who are learning about wine. They want to know that it, that it actually comes from a place. They don't need to use that word, mm. but they, you know, there's an image that uh, a lot of the people that work for me want to have about, you know, you, you put up that. The lovely picture of the bunch of grapes mm. uh, a little bit earlier. They kind of want to feel that. They don't want to think in terms of a lab technician, you know, creating their, creating their, uh, their wine. So uh, it's 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 a great question. It's an enormously complicated question. Uh, what I would say is that uh, the go, I'll go back to the reality, the authenticity issue that that you know you've eloquently described. Uh, I think that there's a need to believe that something is real and it's not just being uh, marketed to them in a slick way. And, and I, I agree with you on the, on the uh, cupcake thing. I didn't have much use for it either. And uh, so there, there you go. Uh, <laughs> I, my, my, great, my sure thing was about 12 years ago, uh, somebody brought me a Starbucks uh, liqueur, and I said, that's a winner. And that disappeared real quickly. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. tough yeah. to know, isn't it? I mean, even, yeah. even those of you who have lots of experience in this business, it's sometimes hey, tough to spot the winners. Get into the Hall of Fame by hitting 320. So with that said, yeah. as the asterisk against what you're about to say, right, which is I've asked you both to make a prediction, and we'll just treat it for what it's worth, right? So um, where is this thing going to go? Leave us with a sound bite. About five years from now, we're in this room. We're having this conversation. We're all talking about what? Well, I think that we're still going to be talking about craft beer and those the, the figures that they showed earlier this morning with craft being flat. That's pretty much true. If you're a craft brand that's in 25 states, that's how we looked at our IRI data. Pick the craft breweries that are in 25 states. Let's look at numbers. Flat? No, well, whatever. Let's pick those that are in 10 states. We're up. Five states, we're up. Three states, we're up. One state, like, for instance, Terrapin in Georgia. Crazy up. Mm. So, you know, those, those numbers they showed can tell you anything they want you, that you want them to tell you. So I think craft is actually up. Um, I think that we're going to see the craft market, it's saturated. I, I can't, I live in a town of 1,200 people and we have three breweries. <laughs> That's crazy. I mean, and they're all within four blocks of each other. What's, what's that all about? How long are they going to last? I don't know. Um, we're going to still be having that conversation. And I think that in five years, we're going to be having a larger conversation on biodynamic and organically produced products. That's across all categories. That's cider, spirits, wine, craft beer. Um, uh, again, the, the flavored vodkas and stuff like that. How long is it going to last? If you're, if you've got a brand and you're going to bring it to market, you know, think about where you want to be in five years. Not, not just that one slot. Like I was saying about our, our buying structure. You know, so many suppliers and producers think, oh, I've got to get something in a national promotion with you, Doug. I've got to. I'm like. No, this is how you grow your business with us. Go make some wins in the regions. We'll build a brand for you. And that's, that's kind of how we do. Great. Don't, don't wait for like the Hail Mary pass. <laughs> you know, get out and do some grassroots. Make, see where you want your brand to be in five years, not where you want it to be in a year. Great. Sandy? Five years. OK, everyone write this down. Um, <laughs> there's going to be a huge oversupply of bourbon. Mm. Tequila will collapse. Everyone will be asking, what's that Malbec? What's this Malbec thing? Yeah. 
Um, <laughs> I think everything is going to be very, very different. You know, anything that, anything that is, that requires a long time frame, people get really excited and they start storing a lot of bourbon. And, you know, now there's a shortage, but by the time that bourbon matures, people will be moving on to the next thing. I'm partly facetious about the tequila, but you guys all know, I'm sure, that it takes eight to 12 years for the agave plant to be harvested, then you have to plant it again. And so there's always gonna be a disconnect between supply and demand because whatever we're excited about now we think is gonna last forever, and it doesn't, and then we're oversupplied. So. Uh, that's as good as I can. Yeah, so pay attention to, to timing, I guess, is the headline there. Mm -hmm. um, thank you both, Sandy and Doug. Great privilege to be on stage with you. Thanks for your time. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And Sandy will be running a session. If you want more Sandy, then he's available at 11 o'clock. Buy the glass. Thank you. Buy the glass, yeah. Buy yeah. The glass. Thank you. Cool, thank you. Very good. Great. Thank Thanks. you. Great, great oh, job. Sure. Yeah.